Exercise 13.4 is asking you to draw the alkoxide formed in a few reactions. Now the idea here is, once you have an alcohol, what can you do with it? And one of the things you can do with it is turn it into a nucleophile. So say, for example, I had drinking alcohol, ethanol. The OH is our functional group that makes it an alcohol. Now, the oxygen here is pretty electronegative, so it pulls electron density to itself, becomes slightly negative, and everything it's bonded to, the hydrogen and the carbon, become slightly positive. They lose their electrons to the more electronegative oxygen atom. And so the oxygen here is a nucleophile, but it's kind of a weak nucleophile. You can make it much more reactive by ripping off this hydrogen. And now that I, I say this, if, you, if the, the term nucleophile is unfamiliar to you, I strongly recommend that you go back and watch in the, uh, the videos on nucleophiles in the playlist to review Organic Chemistry 1. That's a concept that will be present with us for the rest of this semester. Really crucial concept. Okay, so you could turn that into a much stronger nucleophile with a full negative charge. And this had two lone pairs by ripping the hydrogen off and giving this oxygen a full negative charge. And that's gonna make it want to react. Now there are a couple ways you can do this. You can do this by adding a solid, either solid sodium or lithium, or you can add something called sodium hydride. So our goal here is to take just a regular alcohol and make it much more reactive, turn it into a better nucleophile or a better base by ripping the hydrogen off. And we can do that in two ways. So let's explore each of those two ways one at a time. The first way is by just adding a solid metal. Now this is a little strange, and so it gives us an opportunity to discuss what metals are, which is kind of interesting. You look at metals and they often look like solids. But the truth is that they could either be considered solids or they could be considered plasmas. When you look at metals, it's almost as if you're looking at one of these perception games, where it could either be a rabbit, here on the left, you can see the head of the rabbit and the ears of the rabbit there, or it could be a duck. You can see the beak of the duck here, there's the eye of the duck, this is the back of its head. So you could either have a rabbit or a duck. Which one is this? Well, it's kind of depends on how you look at it. It depends on the, the context, the person, and the way they're looking at it. And so the same thing with solid metals. Metals have really, really low electronegativity. So if you have something like this sodium, and this is solid sodium here, they're keeping it in oil in this container because if it's exposed to water, even in the moisture in the air, it bursts into flames. So if you have sodium, sodium is all the way on the left side of the periodic table. It has very low electronegativity, and that means that it doesn't hold on to uh, electrons very well. And again, if this, this concept of electronegativity seems unfamiliar, I strongly encourage you to go back to that review playlist for Organic Chemistry 1. At the very beginning of it is a video that explores electronegativity and the differences in polarity in bonds. So because sodium is way on the left on the periodic table, it gives up electrons very easily. So what happens if you have hundreds of millions of sodium atoms all squished next to each other, which is what you have when you have solid sodium? Well then, an electron on this sodium is not really attached to it. The sodium is, has such low electronegativity that when the electron moves around, it's able to fly over all of the atoms. And here I only have three drawn, but imagine galaxies worth. Imagine hundreds of millions of atoms, and an electron anywhere, anywhere in a metal can fly around all of those hundreds of millions of metal atoms. Okay, so altogether, it could look like a solid, because it sticks together and has a certain hardness, these metals. But there's another phase of matter that you could consider it as and that's a plasma. In a solid, if you have a solid, the atoms are all arranged in a regular way, most of the time. If you heat them up, then you get a liquid. 
and the atoms start moving around each other. They're not rigid anymore, but they still are confined to a definite space, a definite volume. If you heat that up, you get a gas. And now the atoms are moving around, bouncing off of each other, and they're not confined to a definite space. But if you heat that up even more, you end up with a phase of matter that we don't talk about as much, but which is actually the most common phase of matter in the whole universe, and that's a plasma. A plasma is when the protons, neutrons, and electrons in atoms go their own separate ways. They're flying around in a sort of potpourri, in a goo of uh, unorganized subatomic particles. Now we have that sometimes on Earth. The aurora borealis is plasma. It's electrons and protons not associated into atoms. Or if you have that static electricity, maybe as a kid in a slide, you rode down a slide and it sort of shocked you. Or if you go to hand, touch a, a handle sometimes, you'll get a shock. Those are plasmas, subatomic particles not associated into atoms. The reason why plasmas are so common in the universe is because stars are made of plasmas. Stars are hot soups of, of subatomic particles, so hot that they're not associated into atoms. In fact, only 0.25% of all of the protons, neutrons, and electrons in the universe um, are cold enough to form atoms. Okay, so, or sorry, atoms form 0.25% of everything in the universe. 5% of all the, the, the uh, subatomic particles form atoms. Okay, well, the reason why you can think of metals as plasmas is because these electrons are not associated into atoms. They fly, they're flying around the entire structure, not sticking to any protons and neutrons. And so you can sort of think of metals as plasmas. And when you do that, the electrons start to behave in a unique way. They don't, they don't stick to the atoms as much anymore. So what can happen is you can take sodium, and here, just to, for simplicity, I'm only going to write one sodium atom, but you would have hundreds of millions of these. And it can sort of act as a radical. Remember that radicals are atoms that have an unpaired electron. And it could donate one electron. Remember that you use fishhook arrows to show how this happens. It can donate one electron here and steal another electron from this bond. The second electron in the bond goes on the hydrogen. And so after that first step, you'll have a sodium that's now missing a, an electron, so it has a positive charge. And the other thing you'll have is an oxygen, which now has a full negative charge. That's one thing. And the third thing you'll have is this hydrogen radical. Now that process would happen twice. You'd end up with two hydrogen radicals and the two electrons here would pair up. Remember, radicals are very reactive. Unpaired electrons are very reactive. They're like magnets open to, to uh, they're like magnets that are open to, to sticking to anything around them. Ultimately, those two hydrogen radicals would pair up, bond to each other, and this would become hydrogen gas. And that would bubble out of solution. Hydrogen gas is, is, is very light. It, it, it floats really to the top of the atmosphere. You might remember they used to use it in blimps at least until the Hindenburg, which was made of hydrogen gas, which is flammable, burst into flames. Now this is really kind of beautiful to watch. All you have to do is you take a clear liquid like this, you dunk some solid sodium in, you'd see a whole bunch of bubbling, and the bubbles are all this hydrogen gas that leaves, and what you have left is this, um, this oxygen with a full negative charge, remnant of an alcohol. And it's called an alkoxide. You have an alcohol, and this would be an alkoxide. Remember that the prefix alk means any carbon chain. In this case, we have two carbons, so it would technically be F oxide, but the general term is just an alk oxide. That's an oxygen with a negative charge bonded to any carbon chain. Okay. Let me show you what this looks like. So here, if you just... But 
it's a similar reaction. Okay, so <laughs> it's rather a long story just to draw a rather simple thing, but I wanted to give you the conceptual background just in case you were interested. So the, the short version of this is the sodium ends up taking these hydrogens off, making them leave as hydrogen gas, and what you're left with is just the original molecule, but with a full negative charge on the oxygen. And another th thing you'd have is the product of is hydrogen gas. You would also have sodium. Oops. That's balancing that charge. And you'd have two of these, each one forming one hydrogen radical, which then pair up to give you the hydrogen gas. But the alkoxide, the useful thing, what we can use as an oxygen nucleophile or as a base, is there. And this is what solid sodium looks like. Okay, so that would work either if you use solid sodium or if you used solid lithium. So I'm going to skip to C here, just to, to illustrate that. The same process applies. The same mechanism applies. Lithium would donate one electron as a radical to create a hydrogen radical. The hydrogen would bubble away. And you'd ultimately be left with the same exact structure, just instead of the hydrogen, the oxygen would have a full negative charge. It would be balanced by this metal. And you would also have hydrogen gas bubbling away. So that's one way that you can make these alkoxides, these carbon chains that have negatively charged oxygens on them just by dunking some solid sodium or lithium into them. And here you can see what lithium looks like. The other way to make them is with a molecule called sodium hydride. A hydride is a hydrogen atom with two electrons. So a hydride is two electrons on hydrogen, and that gives hydrogen a full negative charge. Now here that's going to be balanced by the positive charge on a sodium. And so that is sodium hydride, this NaH. When it's completely pure, it's a white solid. Oftentimes it's not completely pure, and then it looks a sort of grayish color. So what'll happen here is, and they're not asking for the mechanism, but I want to show it to you just so it's not a random thing to memorize, but rather something to understand. When you have this here, the sodium hydride comes in. And the really reactive thing is the hydrogen. After all, sodium is a pretty big atom, and so it can spread that charge out over its enormous space and be relatively stable. And so it can really just float around the solvent without reacting with much. Hydrogen, on the other hand, is the smallest atom on the periodic table. And stuffing a full charge in that tiny space makes that charge really concentrated and really um, reactive. And so what'll happen, we saw how this oxygen in the alcohol is slightly electronegative, pulls electron density to it, so it becomes slightly negative and everything bonded to it becomes slightly positive. What this hydrogen will do is it'll act as a strong base. It'll steal this alcohol hydrogen, the electrons in the bond will snap back onto the oxygen, and you'll really end up with the same type of thing that we ended up with when we used the solid metal. You'll have The oxygen, now with a full negative charge, because it's gaining the electrons from that bond, and these two hydrogens will pair up as hydrogen gas. And that will bubble out of solution. Okay, so you would end up with these two products. So let's just illustrate that one more time with E, how that would work. So without thinking about the mechanism, or without drawing it, this hydrogen would rip that other hydrogen off. You would end up with the same structure, just the oxygen would have a full negative charge. 
that'll be balanced by the positive charge on the sodium ion, and then hydrogen would bubble away as a gas. And so you'd form this reactive oxygen species, this alk oxide. Alk because you have a carbon chain, oxide because you have a negatively charged oxygen there. There's one last point here that I want to make, and it's kind of a side point, but it's really useful in, in, in a practical sense. And that's if you can ever make a gas a product, do it. The reason why so many pharmaceuticals and so many things that you products you make with organic chemistry are so expensive is because the yields are often rather low. I've known organic chemists who are thrilled, thrilled to get a 7% yield out of what you could theoretically make, so 7% efficiency. And that's because oftentimes you have to do many reactions in a row, and every time you do them, the inefficiency of the reactions compounds. And so when people buy medications, they're not just paying for the medication that they take, they're also paying for all of the waste products that chemists made when they did these inefficient reactions. So anytime you can make an e a reaction efficient, you want to do that. It will save people's lives, ultimately, um, and if it doesn't save people's businesses. And, uh, and one of the ways you can do that is by making a gas one of your products. That has to do with Le Chatelier's principle. And so if you are short on time, you can stop the video here. But if you're interested in this, and how you can use Le Chatelier's principle to make reactions more efficient, I would encourage you to keep watching. It's kind of an interesting thing. I like to compare an equilibrium reaction to a sort of water tank. So the water in the water tank flows to the right, but it's also flowing to the left at the same time. And so it looks like nothing's changing. That's a lot like a, an equilibrium reaction. Now if you pour water on the left side, ultimately the water flows to the right. And that's exactly what happens in Le Chatelier's principle. If you add reactant, it shifts equilibrium to the right. If you pour water on the right side, it'll flow to the left. And that's just what happens in Le Chatelier's principle. If you add products, then it'll shift equilibrium in the direction of the reactants. Similarly, if you were to open a hole up in the bottom of the container and drain out reactants, equilibrium would shift to the left. And if you were to open a hole up on the right side, equilibrium would shift to the right. Now notice, if you want more efficiency in your reaction, then you want equilibrium to shift to the right. So what you, one thing you can do is you can remove products over and over and over again. The more products you remove, the more equilibrium will shift to the right, the more efficient your reaction will be. It's just really hard to remove products most of the time, unless the product is a gas. If the product is a gas, it'll bubble out of solution by itself, and you'll be removing it automatically as it forms. And then equilibrium will shift to the right through Le Chatelier's principle, and that will inc increase your yields. And so if you're thinking of doing this, these types of reactions on your own for practical purposes, um, I strongly encourage you anytime you can to form a gas as a product because it will increase the efficiency of your reactions and that's one of the beauties of using this sodium hydride. So in this video we've talked about a whole bunch of things but the essential things that we talked about were how you can take an alcohol and rip this hydrogen off to turn it into an alkoxide. That makes the oxygen a stronger nucleophile and a stronger base. It makes it more reactive and so it makes the alcohols more useful. And you could do that either by adding solid sodium or lithium, or by adding sodium 